My days among the dead are past. Around me I behold, where'er these casual eyes are cast, the mighty minds of old. My never failing friends are they, with whom I converse day by day. With them I take delight in weal, and seek relief in woe. And while I understand and feel how much to them I owe, my cheeks have often been bedewed with tears of thoughtful gratitude. My thoughts are with the dead, with them I live in long past years. Their virtues love, their faults condemn, partake their hopes and fears, and from their lessons seek and find instruction with a humble mind. My hopes are with the dead, anon my place with them will be, and I with them shall travel on for all futurity, yet leaving here a name I trust that will not perish in the dust. It has been tricky to find a definitive moment for Richard III, mostly because the majority of his portrayals have taken more influence from the Shakespearean play, which made him a villain, and the fact that there aren't many non-Shakespearean Richards, and yet they take influence from the play, even if that includes outright rejecting it. The Richards who are depicted between before and during his reign all have one moment where they decide to be king, whether they always wanted the throne or because they decided they would be the right person for the job. So that's what I'm going to look at today, along with the mystery surrounding Richard. As I said, this moment has to happen before Richard becomes king, but this decision must influence the events of his reign. Therefore, the Black Arrow and Black Adder don't apply here. But on the bright side, all the others do. A god. <laughs> a king. These are the Richards that take the most influence from the Shakespearean play and basically present their own version in plain English. These Richards were introduced as bloodthirsty and always wanted the throne. They wait patiently for Edward to die while cutting down everyone else in between. This is primarily shown in the Tower of London movies. The 1939 film portrays Richard as more sociopathic and malicious. He doesn't exactly have a moment within the film where he takes what he wants. He is shown patiently taking it bit by bit. However, the scene which demonstrates just how committed Richard is to take what he wants comes early on in the film, after Maud proclaims that Richard is like a god to him. Maud, who revels in the pain and torture of others, almost enables his master in a way. They find a common, if cruel, bond, owing to the fact that they both have deformities. When Maud leaves, Richard reveals the beginning of his plans by opening a cabinet that only he has the key to. Within is a diorama of the throne, with several dolls, each representing an obstacle to the throne. Even though he regards his nephews and Clarence with softness in his tone, and touches the dolls kindly, Rathbone has a malevolence in his eyes that shows his ill intent. Throughout the film, Richard regularly returns to his cabinet after another obstacle is killed and throws them on the fire, before finally being able to place his own doll on the throne. The use of Richard's cabinet containing his plans was a clever idea, both in the context of the film and the audience. The latter can keep mental track of how many more people he must go through and predict who will die next. Meanwhile, if a character in the film were to come across it, Richard would easily be able to explain the diorama as being something innocent. It does not overtly prove any of his wrongdoings. The Vincent Price film makes Richard more sympathetic, though he does see the deaths of those he kills, with the exception of Anne, as a means to an end. The film begins later in the timeline than the 1939 film, where Edward is on his deathbed but Clarence is still alive. Edward names Clarence to be regent for his son, and Richard kills him because he thinks Clarence is weak and would endanger the kingdom. He also takes out two birds with one stone by framing the Woodfields for his murder. The monologue he gives on the battlements afterwards, and his conversation with his mother, shows Richard attempting to justify his actions to himself. He desires the throne and is willing to kill for it, but he isn't sure if he likes doing it. He only knows that the world thinks he is a monster because of his deformities, and the best way to defend himself is to become king and protect himself from insults and hate with authority. Both films show Richard at the bottom of the ladder, but beginning to climb it. 
it's a slow ascent, but he is patient, and he moves so slowly that those sitting at the higher points don't notice him closing in on them until it is too late. Within that circlet lies paradise, the amalgamation of every joy and blessing the poets have dreamt. Until I die with glory and acclaim, I'll serve as king for the sake of his name. The anime starts Richard off from the start of the Wars of the Roses, albeit a little bit older than he actually was. His desire for the throne does not come until episode 6 when he goes to rescue Edward from imprisonment. He observes that neither of his brothers are fit to be king. Edward's lack of awareness got him captured by Warwick, while George is too submissive to Warwick, who would just be ruling through him. Nonetheless, Richard would prefer Edward to remain king if just to get rid of Warwick. Richard does not outright state he wants the throne until episode 15, when asked by Buckingham what he wants. When Richard does become king, he learns it is not what he hoped it would be. He believed as a child that the crown promised paradise to the wearer, but now he is finally at the top, he's realised how lonely it is to be looking down upon everyone else. So this isn't exactly a Richard who takes what he wants, because he never knows what he wants. Whenever he finds a happy moment with someone he loves, it is taken away, either because the person he loves is actually his enemy, or life simply gets in the way. What Richard really wanted was to be loved by his other half, but first he had to figure out who that was. It was not until his body double was staring down at him, saying that he loved him, that he realised he was never in two halves to begin with. He had to learn to love himself. He doesn't take what he wants, he realises he had what he wanted all along. We could have raised Prince Edward together. I know if I crown him, he'd only take your counsel. And I cannot trust you. I am your grace. King to be, though you will never see me crowned. The White Queen doesn't follow Richard as closely as I would have liked it to. He starts out with only a handful of scenes before his significance expands greatly. As the series is told through the experiences of Elizabeth Woodville, Anne Neville and Margaret Beaufort, there is little access into the workings of Richard's innermost thoughts and desires. I believe him when he says he loves Anne. He isn't afraid to take what he wants here, because it benefits both him and Anne, and he's more likely to be on Edward's good side because of his loyalty, unlike George who betrayed him twice. But does he want the throne? I don't think he does. He takes it because he doesn't want the Woodvilles to have it, and because he is convinced by his mother and Anne to do so. I mean, if you had spent most of your political career faithfully serving your king, only to find out that his wife was going to defy his deathbed wishes and replace you with her own family, and you'd be pushed out of the inner circle altogether, of course you'd be a little bit annoyed. Richard is definitely at his strongest in episodes 6 to 9 which shows him becoming disillusioned with both brothers and taking the throne. Not because he wants it, but because, again, he doesn't want the Woodvilles to have it. Both factions are manipulated slightly by Beaufort and Stanley, but it does not create new feelings that weren't already there. What Richard wants is to protect his loved ones, and his taking the throne is the means of doing that, not knowing that Beaufort had ulterior motives. And this is why the incest storyline was a total character assassination of Richard, because it shows him completely abandoning the principles he stuck to in order to become king in the process. I mean, shoving it into a single episode was bad enough, because the pacing was too quick. But to have him turn around in the stars cut to state that he did love Lizzie betrays the feelings he had for Anne. In the earlier episodes, she was his anchor and he was willing to risk his brother's scorn to marry her. But oh no, he was lying to her when he said he was only pretending to desire his niece, which completely spits on the foundation of trust that the couple built. I'd have been happy to call this the best Richard if they didn't completely betray his character faster than that of any story arc in Game of Thrones. The horrible histories version of Richard was adamant about rejecting all the accusations against him, and as the show is told in sketches rather than an ongoing narrative, it's trickier to get a definitive moment out of him. He's taking a posthumous stance to clear his name, 
He is so indignant that his ghost has to settle the score with Shakespeare, while his song has him deny the accusations and justify his taking the throne because the princes were too young to rule. By default, Rich's definitive moment was his song, where he paints himself as not being as evil as he's been made out to be. And yes, he had nothing to do with the death of his brother Clarence, and his wife likely died of natural causes. But he never puts forward a convincing counter-argument as to who may have killed the princes if he didn't. I mean, not that I mind, because this song slaps. I'm a nice guy. How's this for timing? I always meant to talk about the ableism in Richard III, but recently there has been an outcry against the artistic decision behind a new production of the play to be shown in May this year at the Globe Theatre. I guess what appeared to be an attempt at political correctness turned into another Speedy Gonzales situation. First let's talk about Richard's portraits, then we'll get into all that. No surviving portrait of Richard III was made in his lifetime. The Richard III Society notes that there are at least a dozen Richard portraits, and all seem to be copies of a royal collection portrait. This was also not painted in his lifetime, but appears to be taken from a now lost portrait from June 1483. Royal portraits always featured their kings and queens in elaborate clothing, and Richard was no exception. He is typically shown wearing a heavy gold chain, has a jewelled brooch in his hat and showing his ringed hand, where he is often shown fidgeting with the one on his little finger. One has to remember that these paintings were made with a hefty dose of bias, as Richard was the Tudor's scapegoat in order for them to justify their reign. Unlike a typical Tudor portrait where the wearer gives a neutral expression as a subject is often sitting still for a very long time and would want to keep their faces relaxed, Richard is typically shown with pursed lips and narrow eyes to underline a malevolent nature, despite the resplendent backdrop. The portrait has been subject to analytical scrutiny, where it underwent an x-ray in the 1970s and was later photographed with infrared in 2016. It was revealed that the portrait had indeed been tampered with. Richard's eyes and lips were originally in a neutral expression. What's more, Richard's shoulders were deliberately made uneven to exaggerate the crook back that Shakespeare and Thomas More claimed he had. It is believed, therefore, that the Royal Collection portrait was changed, perhaps by the original artist, in order for it to become approved by the Tudor court. Others, who also wanted a large collection, would commission copies of this altered portrait, which all had Richard with similar features. The more famous copies are the National Portrait Gallery Richard, featuring him in black and gold against a red background, and the Bartell portrait, which has Richard in red and gold against a blue background. There is a lesser known portrait, presumably painted in the early 16th century by an unknown artist, where Richard is holding a broken sword over his left shoulder, rather than playing with a ring. However, while this portrait may seem more dignified, a broken sword is often a signifier that the holder was defeated in battle, which was nothing to celebrate in the days of knights and chivalry. It is almost like a mocking parody of a more triumphant portrait like that of William the Conqueror. When Richard III's body was discovered after centuries of being lost, his key identifier was the curved spine. Before then, Richard's less favourable depictions showed him with the full list of deformities, while the kinder ones showed him with none at all. However, there was a grain of truth in what Shakespeare and Moore wrote, and what his remains ultimately proved. Richard had a condition known as scoliosis, which causes the spine to curve in an S or C shape. In extreme cases, it can cause respiratory problems or interrupt the digestive system. It is a condition that one can develop from a number of reasons, including genetically, which would not be a surprise given that many noble families tended to marry their cousins. A study on his remains by the University of Leicester concluded that Richard may have developed scoliosis in his adolescence. However, Dr Joe Appleby added that his condition would likely have not been noticeable when Richard was fully clothed. It did not appear to cause him much physical restraint as he was still willing to lead his troops into battle and partake in them himself. 
However, there are likely rumours that Richard had a twisted spine when he was alive and the Tudor historians decided to exaggerate this into him being a full-on hunchback. The 16th and 17th centuries saw a superstitious world slowly become more practical, but religious fervour was still rampant, and superstitious folk believed that a deformed individual or someone who just had an abnormally large birthmark was proof that someone had been a devil spawn or a changeling and they would be inherently evil and cause great suffering to others. The individuals in question would be heavily persecuted and sometimes killed by mobs. Others may have found work as jesters for richer clients, especially those born with dwarfism. In Shakespeare, one can argue if Richard's deformities being a sign of his evil may have been a self-fulfilling prophecy, especially when taking the expanded universe of the Henriad into account. Richard appears to be treated well by his brothers and father, and his mother's animosity towards him does not appear until we are well into Richard III. He is insulted for his appearance primarily by his enemies like Clifford or Queen Margaret. By Act 3, Scene 2 of Henry VI, Part 3, Richard declares his wish to be king, purely because he believes he is suited for nothing else. He has grown up surrounded by the ideals of chivalry and courtly romance, but his appearance tells him he is suited for neither. Why love forswore me in my mother's womb. He later tells himself, at the beginning of his own play, that he was not made for sportive tricks or to court an amorous looking glass. Now that war is over, the only thing he knows is violence, so he continues to choose violence, since he believes that the world cannot grant him anything else. Now, back to this controversy I mentioned in the beginning. I realise I go between controversy and controversy, it's just sometimes I go between Britishisms and Americanisms, that's just it's what happens when you grow up exposed to media from both sides of the pond. The context for this is that Michelle Terry has decided to play Richard III with, I quote, no visible or physical impairments in an upcoming production. Terry interpreted Shakespeare's text as saturated with ableism and wants to unpack that by showing Richard without any of the deformities he's typically shown with and explore the play's tyranny and abuse of power and toxic misogyny. However, disabled artist groups, and I was very surprised to discover this, have criticised the decision to have Richard be played by an able-bodied performer because Richard III, or at least his Shakespearean counterpart, has been reclaimed by the disabled community. In my Hot Takes video, all the actors I listed were able-bodied, but their interpretations were more of an exploration of Richard's mind and experimenting with putting the play's context into different areas of history. And I decided to save the ableism aspect for this video. I can understand why a character best known for his disabilities, even a villainous one, can be reclaimed by a marginalised community. For example, the queer community embraces Disney villains, and sometimes they identify more with the monster in a typical horror movie because they can't relate to the conventional heterosexual leads. I mean, that was the entire point behind the Rocky Horror Picture Show. The truth is, when you are part of a marginalised community, you tend to latch on to whatever representation you can and make it your own. Richard's villainy is almost heroic in a way because understanding the discursive quality of disability in the play allows us to recognise Richard's Machiavellian interiority as a patriarchal control over societal expectations. When Richard decides to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on my own deformity, he is not using his bodily difference as an excuse for bad behaviour. Rather, he recognises the cultural capital that his crooked back delivers. Richard not only lies to the other characters in the play, but also relies on half-truths, and double meanings to mislead the theatre audience. Richard recognises the prejudices of others as an empowering tool. The audience perception of Richard's evil is based primarily on his actions, but the lasting effect of his villainy is aided by the ableist notions of the normative body. Just as a prosthetic limb creates discomfort in others, so the prosthetic king seems to be out of place on the head of the body politic. Richard empowers himself by carefully walking a line between his embodied reality and his social self, leveraging the ableist notions that construct his body as disabled in the first place for social capital. I don't know how this production will play out. They may double down and keep Terry in the role of Richard, 
or they may bow to public pressure and cast a disabled actor. Of course, I don't have a stake in this, because I don't have a disability. But it seems that no one on the production team has anyone with a disability either. I could be wrong, you can correct me on that if I am, but what I'm seeing here is an attempt to be sensitive to the real Richard and criticise the false sources behind the play, while still appreciating Shakespeare's work. However, at the same time as all this, they are shutting out the people who would most benefit from tackling the ableist elements of Richard III. It's like casting a white Othello because you're trying not to be racist. There are some white Othellos out there, by the way, not just the ones that were in blackface. And the reasons behind them just completely miss the point. Theatre and Shakespeare should be for everyone, and I fear doing something like this, no matter how good the intentions were, is just going to keep things more separate. If you get the DVD of the Laurence Olivier Richard III, it comes with a second disc that contains the trial of Richard III, where Richard is tried in absentia for the deaths of the princes in the tower. It is three and a half hours long and very, very boring. The only entertaining thing about it is the realisation that David Starkey's voice hasn't changed since 1984 and why the hell did he get rid of that moustache? I was hoping to take something from it to present my own arguments, but because it is such a slog to get through, I will just work through my own theories, because honestly, that thing is unwatchable. Richard may not have murdered his nephews, but it is very improbable that he is innocent. He had, deliberately, placed the only two barriers between him and the throne in the Tower of London, which was almost impossible for an enemy army to seize. I say almost because the Peasants' Revolt was a thing. Elizabeth Woodville was cut off from her supporters in Westminster Abbey, with the head of her family, Anthony, and a son from a previous marriage, Richard Grey, executed. The motive and opportunity for Richard III was right there. When the princes disappeared, he never acknowledged as to whether they were alive or dead, leading to wide speculation that they had been killed, and he was the culprit. What seems odd, however, is that Richard managed to get nobility and gentry on his side, through a swift coup and capitalising on the hatred of the Woodvilles at court. Was he so confident in his power that he thought he could dispose of his nephews with no consequences? This question in particular springs up because we live in a post-Game of Thrones world, a post-Dune world, where we have enjoyed new stories of factions and schemers weighing out their options before acting, and having backup plans, tricking their enemies into doing their bidding without realising, and the ripple effect of one character acting on their impulses is felt way down the line. So it blows my mind that someone as seemingly cunning as Richard would not have considered that killing his nephews would have caused such backlash. It is giving Littlefinger in Season 7, as opposed to Tywin in Season 3 is all I'm saying. And were those skeletons discovered under some stone slabs at the bottom of a staircase, the actual skeletons of the princes? Again, probable, but not concrete, despite the skeletons seeming to be the ages of the princes when they disappeared. There has not been any DNA testing on them, as the royal family have refused any further analysis. And even if the skeletons were the princes, it does not definitively prove that Richard killed them. Let's address the Welsh dragon in the room and consider if Henry VII or Margaret Beaufort could have killed the princes from afar in order for Henry to frame Richard and claim England as a Lancastrian hero restoring order to the realm. The biggest flaw to this theory is that Henry was an exile overseas and he would have had to depend on his allies back home getting into the tower, killing the princes, hiding the bodies and leaving without Richard's knowledge. Then again, one of the strongest arguments that Henry Tudor ordered their deaths is that he ordered no investigation into the prince's deaths when he became king, and publicly condemned Richard for usurping and killing his nephews. Then again, it appears that Henry VII was determined to prove himself a monarch in his own right, and ignore the Plantagenet's claims, including his own wife's, when he finally got his hands on the crown. While the princes were presumed dead, the lack of remains at the time meant there was a slim possibility that they were alive and may come to take the throne, so Henry had to assert that they were actually dead. Henry's biggest ally back in England was his mother, Margaret Beaufort, who was present at court with her third husband, Lord Stanley, who was on relatively good terms with the Yorkists, though Richard's intention to keep Stanley in good favour was mainly a way of keeping his friends close and enemies closer. 
Richard never fully trusted Stanley, hence he took his son hostage before Bosworth. Stanley became High Constable of England after suppressing Buckingham's rebellion. This is not to be confused with Constable of the Tower of London. The Lord High Constables of England were, and still are, responsible for the King's military and security. Richard III himself held this title when he was protecting the North against Scottish invasion. Stanley may have had the means to send assassins into the Tower undetected at his wife's behest, but the princes had disappeared a few months before Buckingham's rebellion, where the figurehead changed from Edward V to Henry Tudor. By then the princes were already presumed dead. This possibility hurts my brain a little, because it seems like a real stretch to try and absolve Richard of any wrongdoing. Henry VII was not above killing his rivals and having other people do it, as his actions at Bosworth demonstrate, but it is still more improbable than Richard being the culprit. Philippa Gregory was not the only one who put this theory in their story. Requiem for the Rose King also has Henry kill the princes, only this time he's more upfront about it by travelling England in disguise and smuggling poison candy to the princes, which Shrewsbury wasn't going to share with his brother until they bonded over how much they hated their enemies. But, again, the anime was always going to be more fictional than fact. The other, more innocent possibility, is that the princes died of natural causes. Child mortality was not uncommon in the medieval era, and this was the notion I prescribed to when I visited the Tower of London for the first time. Richard, and most of his court, was not in London at the time of the prince's disappearance, as it was common for royals to go out on progress during the summer months to avoid the peak plague season. Plague spread through fleas on rodents, which could have easily found their way into the tower, infected the boys and killed them. To avoid the infection spreading, the boys would have likely been hastily buried. This would have erased the possibility of Richard having the bodies shown to the public to confirm that they died naturally. Only, if they did die naturally, why did Richard not make a public declaration, as he did when he denounced rumours that he was going to marry his niece? Why did he stay silent? Even if they didn't die a plague and succumb to something less contagious like dysentery or consumption, why were they hidden to the point that we can't definitively say that the skeletons at the bottom of the stairs really were them? Maybe one day there will be a definitive answer. But with the support built behind Richard, there will always be people asserting that he never would have harmed children. A.J. Pollard observes that it is curious that many should claim that they have felt compelled to clear Richard III's name after seeing Shakespeare's play. Perhaps there is an unwillingness to accept that evil can be attractive, a compulsion therefore to make what is attractive good. Perhaps Richard never voiced the possible demise of the princes because a he would still be held responsible for letting them come to harm as their guardian, even if he didn't do it, and b, if he was indeed innocent and someone else broke into the tower to frame him, he'd have to admit that the Tower of London, England's largest stronghold, could be compromised by a couple of assassins. How would that make him look? In my heart of hearts, I really don't want to believe that Richard would have been foolish enough to kill his nephews and think no one would have followed him up on it unless he was really riding high on his own success and thought he was invulnerable. And given he had executed Hastings, so hastily, no one close to him was willing to tell him that was a bad idea. You can't expect human beings to make the smart decision all the time. Everyone's entitled to their own theory on what really happened. I've got a theory, it could be Barney's. But just remember that no matter how you interpret an individual, they are not flawless and can make drastic mistakes. Well, I'm a hair's breadth from investigating bunnies at the moment, so I'm open to anything. So, was Richard done dirty? Yes. He was accused of things he didn't do and had his image warped throughout the centuries. However, I feel that attempts by pro-Ricardians to redeem his image throughout history makes him a little too perfect and have to jump through hoops in order to make him innocent of all the crimes he's accused of. Granted, in the Gregory verse he actually does kill Henry VI, but he's joined by Edward and George, so he only gets a portion of the blame. And how is it that we have never seen a Richard where he doesn't have all the physical attributes given to him by Moore and Shakespeare, but they actually acknowledge his scoliosis? That would grant a certain community a little bit of representation. We can acknowledge that Richard was not downright evil and spent his entire life caught between a rock and a hard place. 
I don't think he will always be overshadowed by his Shakespearean counterpart, as there now seems to be just as loud a voice debunking it, but we'll never really know what the real Richard was like. However, I do think that Richard had blood on his hands just like everyone else who played a major role in the Wars of the Roses. He happened to be the Tudor's scapegoat, because he was the only one that Henry VII defeated. Kings and queens, and any world leader for that matter, are prone to being remembered as an idea, not a person. The idea of Richard III is as the cunning manipulator who brought down his family's dynasty from the inside by turning everyone against him. But Richard the Person appears to be someone trying to secure the Plantagenet and Yorkist hold on the throne of England at all costs, not wanting the choking influence of the Woodvilles to overpower them. He was familiar with war and bloodshed since he was a child. He chose violence because it was all he knew. To his fans, Richard III will always be our bad boy. He was noble in a way, went down fighting while his opponents sat back and watched. He wasn't afraid to break the rules. By doing him dirty, his opponents just made him more popular and lovable. Right, I'm just gonna get this outro done nice and quick because it is nearing half past eight on Monday night and I wanna get this video done and ready for early access for my patrons. And tomorrow on Tuesday, we shall wrestle with the YouTube copyright demons. Hopefully they shall be appeased in time for the video to come out on Tuesday. If not, hello Wednesday. Hope you're enjoying yourself. But yes, that's the end of Richard III. I was going to include the Edward IV conspiracy theory, but I think I might save that for Elizabeth Woodville because I couldn't find a way to just naturally put the whole Edward IV thing in Richard's story because the Princess in the Tower is one thing, it's directly linked to Richard, but Edward IV is like, that's some, that's a whole problem that was happening before Richard even became remotely relevant. Now, Richard III was a choice made by my patrons. I am going to put the next poll on Patreon for those to choose. And the next choices will be Robert Dudley, Elizabeth Woodville, Mary Boleyn, or Cardinal Wolsey. Preferably someone that I can just do in a single video because I think I want to cover more people this year so we're not thinking, oh, so when's this ranking video for this person coming out? When's the ranking video for this person coming out? If we can just get like a stack of single video coverages out in a, out within the year and um, maybe some bigger projects that take multiple videos, that's fine by me because I don't want to be thinking, oh, I really, really want to work on that project, but I've got to finish this one first. I'm finishing up Mary Queen of Scots next month and I will announce the winner of that Patreon poll in the conclusion of that video. Speaking of my patrons, I must thank them for their generosity. You can find their names in the credits right here and my top tier level patrons deserve an almighty shout out. So thank you, Alison Cuff, Anna from Gustine, Annalise Barnett, Jill My Nero, Larissa and Leslie Williams. Now, as I'm talking to you from the past, it is time to wrestle with those copyright demons. Oh, and please make sure you subscribe to the channel. That's very important.